And so I'm Chris Jackson I'm at University of Tennessee in Memphis and talking tonight about some updates in general internal medicine. Uh, hopefully my titles of pickles and waterfalls and more will make more sense um, as we go through a, a few trials on this evening. This is an outline of the presentation for tonight. I have uh, one small disclosure uh, that I consider a fun one uh, when talking about the subject, some rules for evidence-based medicine and practice, how did I select the articles for this clinical update, and then how we'll review these articles, and then finally some conclusions. And I definitely would hope that there'll be time at the end for some questions and some back and forth discussion. So as Rob mentioned, I have no relevant financial disclosures to any of the content um, in this presentation. Discussing uh, evidence-based medicine, evidence-based practice is my happy place, whether talking with my residents, being in the clinic, talking with patients, or even right now talking with you all. And this is a safe space for us to discuss and, and inquire about you know, the limitations of evidence and also how easily this evidence can be translated into clinical practice. So before I go into that, I always like to kind of anchor or start presentation with you know, moments of gratitude. Um, and so uh, the two women on this side uh, play very particular roles in my EBM journey. Uh, the woman on the left uh, happens to be uh, my grandmother who was a nurse for over 50 years and really embodied to me one principle of EBM that um, EBM is all about the patient. It's all about caring for the patient. It's about taking the knowledge we have and translating it in a way where we can make a decision that is patient-centered at best. And even if I didn't have the language of EBM then, just uh, thinking about the stories my grandmother told of being involved in patient care and how you know, keeping the patient's concerns utmost uh, certainly is a, is a great reminder to me as we talk through all these trials that, yes, there are numbers, there are data points, but there are people um, that are behind not only these trials, but also people that we will treat in our clinics and the hospital, et cetera, that we need to be mindful of um, when we're applying the evidence. The person on the right, I have the great fortune to be a, a career mentor to me now for many years, uh, Danny Zipkin, a professor of medicine at Duke University, who really demonstrated to me what a career as a generalist could look like uh, in EBM uh, with an attention to how I could take that love of EBM and write about it in research or present about it at different conferences. and so. Um, I would not be able to be here and do this talk today if it were not for these two women. So one of the objectives of this talk was really to highlight, you know, some of the rules of EBM. And I think these rules are important because without them, EBM on the surface can seem quite formulaic, quite robotic. And I would hope by the end of the time tonight that I could convince you that's not the case. So rule number one, and all of these are taken uh, from the Duke EBM course uh, that happens every year, is not all evidence is created equal. If you look on the left-hand column, this is a very common schematic that is taught in medical school and other health professional uh, schools regarding uh, evidence, going all the way from background information, expert opinion, up to this kind of top or pinnacle of the pyramid which is systematic review and meta-analysis. And to some extent, that um, evidence pyramid can be true, but it actually has two underlying assumptions. One assumption is that we're talking about questions of therapy, is drug A better than drug B for condition C? And it also assumes that each of these different parts of this pyramid, um, each study design is done to its most optimal. So I say that just as a reminder that a poorly done randomized control trial does not necessarily tell me that much more than a cohort study. And therefore, uh, multiple poorly done randomized control trials combined together in a systematic review and meta-analysis don't necessarily tell me that much more, except that I have a whole bunch of not so great randomized control trials. On the right-hand side, 
I have depicted something very important, which is thinking about what type of questions we're asking. So when we're asking therapy questions, randomized control trials are the holy grail. Um, however, when we're asking questions of harm, if we're asking questions of prognosis, um, randomized control trials are actually not the best trial for that. Oftentimes, prospective cohort studies will be better for that. So recognize that not all evidence is created equal and depending upon what question you're asking, what is the best evidence quote might change. The second rule is evidence alone is never enough. Every day we go through this cycle in EBP where there's a patient dilemma that we formulate into a question we ask and we try to go and acquire the best evidence to answer the question. We appraise that evidence in some systematic way and hopefully apply and act on it with the patient. But even in that cycle, there's a few things I think are important. One, yes, we want to do this to get the best scientific evidence. But remember, it started with a patient dilemma. And with that patient dilemma, you might bring in your own clinical experience about how to resolve this dilemma or not. And then there's also the patient there too, making sure that their values and their preferences are accounted for in the decisions we make. So for me, just simply gathering evidence is not the end of EVP. It's actually probably just the beginning. It's trying to find this sweet spot of all these intersecting circles um, to make sure that we're practicing consistent with the best evidence for our patients. And finally, clinicians make recommendations. Uh, we can say you should do something or you shouldn't do something, and that can be based off strong, we have a strong conviction you should or not so strong. And I think that's important because at least for me, my patients you know, are adults, you know, I cannot force them to do things, but I can certainly apprise them of what the benefit and risk are of certain therapies, what's the known harms of certain exposures, and try my best to help them make the best decision possible. But I think recognizing that we make recommendations uh, allows us to keep a bit of EBM humility that I think is important, you know, as we're helping patients navigate sometimes the complex nature of evidence for whatever condition um, they might be afflicted with. So these are some grounding rules in EBM, EBP that I would say throughout our discussion tonight and as you go back into whatever your clinical context is to keep in mind um, with patients. And again, why is this important? It's again, EBM is not robotic or algorithmic. You do have to carefully consider how to apply quote the evidence to each patient and you maintain some degree of humility and I would argue even respect with your patients. Um, when you can say that your recommendations are grounded in um, uh, strong support from trials or not so strong support. So how did select articles for this update? I tried to focus on articles published between May 2022 and February 2023. And I had a simple criteria for selecting an article. It either had to change practice in some way, had to modify practice or confirm it and try to include both outpatient and inpatient focused articles considering the breadth of what we see in general internal medicine. Uh, so the, these are kind of how I came across the articles for this update. Now for each article that we'll go through, and there are five of them, we'll use a case to frame the article. Uh, we'll do what's called a PICO breakdown of the article, which I'll explain in a little bit. We'll review the results of the article and then talk about some opportunities with that article for clinical practice. So as with everything, I always like to start with a case to kind of ground things. So let's say there's a 59 year old man with cirrhosis due to NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and prior urinary obstruction due to BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy presenting to clinic for follow up. His primary concern is painful muscle cramps that wake him up from sleep. He has these five out of seven nights in a week. Besides his medications for cirrhosis, he takes gabapentin and magnesium for these cramps with little improvement. You get labs at this visit and it's notable for normal electrolytes. 
So just a question to ponder, um, and if you feel so inclined, you can place in the chat too. Um, but which of the following interventions could reduce cramp severity in this patient? So I just want you to look at these for a second, um, and then I'll share with you kind of the first trial that I think is interesting. All right, hopefully you got an opportunity to just think about what your answer might be based off what you know right now. So PICO is a way we think about formulating clinical questions and it stands for patient intervention, comparator and outcome. So the study that I'm about to show you was a study that looked at adult patients with cirrhosis of all causes. And the intervention was sips of pickle juice and the comparator was sips of water, and they looked at uh, reducing cramp severity and frequency as reported by patients. So that is the study that we're looking at. Now, why is this important? Uh, as of 2018 data, over 4.5 million patients are diagnosed with cirrhosis um, in the U.S. And of those, you know, two thirds of them have muscle cramps that significantly limit or impact their quality of life. And unfortunately, there are not effective safe therapies for muscle cramps supported by large, well-designed randomized controlled trials, or even large, well-designed prospective cohorts. So this trial is the PICKLES trial. It, is, it was a multi-center, one-to-one block randomization, non-blinded trial. And we'll talk a little bit about what that whole block randomization means. It's 84 patients. And you might say, well, gee, that doesn't seem like a lot of patients. Um, it can be challenging, actually, to study patients with cirrhosis. And I can tell you that this is uh, the previous trials looking at interventions for cramps probably enrolled somewhere between 20 to 30 patients. So relatively speaking, this was a large group of patients with cirrhosis. Um, these patients had to have at least four cramps in the past month of their diagnosis of cirrhosis. For those that received pickle juice, it had to be dill, not bread and butter. Um, and that was based off making sure that it had a pH of less than 4.5. And they used something called the visual analog scale, which we've all probably had some contact with. Rate your pain on a scale of one to 10. Um, and there being like different uh, facial expressions to say this is one, this is five, this is 10. So let's take a step back and say first, why on earth pickle juice for cramps? Like, how would that help? And there is some thought that pickle brine binds to sensory transient receptors. Um, and when that happens, that there is foregut acid sensing ion channels that are engaged that then leads to nerve conduction, the oral pharynx, which can send a signal then to resolve the cramp. This is kind of the basic science thought behind why pickle juice for cramps might work. Now, before we get into the data, I think it's important to think about the setup of this trial. So this is a, a RCT. And to think about why do we randomize? So in an ideal world, we randomize because we want to take some patients and through a process of randomization, put them into a group, an intervention or a control and look to see if they attain a certain outcome. Now, if we are, if we randomize effectively, we hope that any factors that can impact or influence them developing those outcomes are evenly spread across both groups so that the only thing that can uh, account for differences in outcome is just whether they got the intervention or not. That's what we hope. But unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. It, you know, we can endeavor to do this with simple randomization. But unfortunately, for many reasons, this doesn't happen in trials. And when it doesn't happen, it is probably one of the biggest uh, uh, downsides to an RCT is that it doesn't necessarily, we can't necessarily say with as much certainty that the outcomes we're seeing are truly due to intervention versus control. So the question, 
is how can we impact that? So to give you an example, um, I'm gonna just choose simple randomization. Um, so I have kind of 12 orange circles here and I'm going to do a coin toss and there's gonna be a group heads and a group tails. And when I do that, um, I get this result. Now this is a randomized procedure. Um, eight to four, so heads, tails, simple randomization. However, there's a problem. And that problem could be that if there was a prognostic factor, I put a D in here to represent diabetes. As you can see, these two groups are now quite different. So even though I did a procedure of randomization, um, these groups have a prognostic factor that's so different between them that whatever outcome I achieve, if diabetes impacts that outcome, I have a problem. So how could I alleviate that issue? And that's where block randomization comes in. So in this trial, I might want to make sure that there are a similar number of patients with cirrhosis from one cause versus another and we'll name them X and Y. I always want them in a one-to-one -one ratio. So if I do that, you know, if I'm randomizing people in blocks of four, if there are two people with X's, then I can say the last two people will be Y. If this is X and Y, then the last two people have to be X and Y. If it's Y and Y, like here, last two people have to be X. And the same thing can be done um, if you're doing a, a different block size. So all the blocking does is to make sure we're preserving numbers of characteristics and fixed ratios. Um, again, so that hopefully prognostic factors are not so different between groups that they impact our interpretation of the results. So let's look at this Pickles trial. Um, these patients were in their late 50s. Um, again, the vast majority of them had NAFLD. Um, most had a meld around 11. They were having anywhere from 11 to 12 cramps per month with most of them uh, interfering with sleep and a decent proportion of them used magnesium. And when we look at changes in the visual analog scale, we can see um, a much larger um, change in visual analog scale scores with pickle juice as compared to tap water. So what they were advised to do is anytime that they felt a cramp, they should take a sip of pickle juice or a sip of tap water and then record what their pain scale level was after doing that. So if you had to look at a bottom line for this summary uh, for this particular uh, trial, sips of pickle juice did seem to decrease cramp severity in patients with cirrhosis. However, it did not reduce the prevalence of them. Now, one concern with this trial is because pickle juice is quite salty and some of these patients may also have concomitant heart or, or kidney disease, they did actually look to see if there was significant weight gain across the group that uh, was randomized to receive pickle juice, and they did not see that, thankfully. Now, there are some considerations, you know, again, going back to what's important to your patient, if a patient came to me and said that they wanted their cramps completely gone. I don't know necessarily that pickle juice is the answer there. Um, if they say that they want their cramps to be less severe, I do think pickle juice can be an answer. This was a short trial with short follow-up, so we do need long-term data. And these patients were having a large number of cramps. And so it's unclear if the benefit would be the same if the patients had a lower incidence of cramps. And so I would say that for this patient that wants to reduce the severity of the cramp, the pickle juice probably is a reasonable option. Let's go to another case. You have a 59-year-old woman coming to the ED with epigastric abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. And vital signs in ED show tachycardia, but a normal blood pressure. On workup, she has gallstones or abdominal ultrasound, elevated transaminase levels, concerning for gallstone pancreatitis. And the internal medicine resident is contemplating how aggressive they need to be with fluid resuscitation. And so uh, the question here is kind of what's the best fluid resuscitation for 
um, this patient. Um, and this is done a bit agnostic to the type of fluid, whether that's lactate ringers, normal saline, just talking about how we would go about uh, giving this fluid is the question being asked here. So I'll leave this up here for a few seconds and then we'll talk about this next study. All right. So looking at PICO here, what we're at, we're looking at are hospitalized adult patients with acute pancreatitis. And we're, the intervention is aggressive fluid resuscitation with a type of fluid, lactated ringers, versus moderate or non-aggressive fluid resuscitation with the same fluid. And we want to look at whether patients have differences in the development of worsening pancreatitis or fluid overload. So why is this important? Um, pancreatitis is a very common cause for hospitalization in the U.S. And, you know, it can take a couple of different flavors, um, kind of classic interstitial edematous pancreatitis or necrotizing uh, pancreatitis. And we know that somewhere in the, from admission to 48 hours is kind of, or 72 hours, excuse me, is the window by which we're either going to declare that the patient is going to have hopefully resolution of pain and be fine, or that they're going to progress to worsening disease. Um, what we know for sure in terms of therapy is that fluids are kind of a first line therapy and treatment for patients. And therefore, how much fluid we give and what type of fluid we give could significantly impact outcomes. Now, there have been multiple guidelines um, for a while for fluid resuscitation in pancreatitis. If you'll look at the best, most of them are moderate quality. They do seem to overwhelmingly support lactated ringers. However, you'll notice that the guidelines waffle a little bit in terms of the rate or volume. So how fast should we give it and how much total should we give um, across the four guidelines depicted on this slide. So this was the so-called waterfall trial. It was multi-center stratified randomization parallel group trial of 249 patients that had pancreatitis with pain less than 24 hours after onset. And the outcome was the development of moderate to severe pancreatitis. Now, in the previous trial, I talked about blocking. And in this, I'm talking about stratification. And these are interconnected but different concepts. So stratification is balance of one or a few pre-specified prognostic characteristics between treatment groups versus blocking is ensuring a balance of the number of patients assigned to each treatment group. Again, that kind of one-to-one -one ratio we described. And so I wanna go back to my example of talking about diabetes to illustrate stratification a little bit. So let's say we had these patients, each of these circles represents a patient that we want to randomize into this trial. And we have some outcome or we have some prognostic factor, in this case, we'll call it S, um, that impacts how likely a person is or is not to achieve a certain outcome. So before we decide to randomize them and put them into an intervention or into a control group, what we would do is this so-called stratification. So we would separate out here are all the S's and here are those that are not an S. And then after doing that, randomize them into placebo and to treatment groups. So what does this do? This makes sure that this prognostic factor um, is represented the same across the placebo and treatment groups. And therefore, when we look at the results, we would hope then that this prognostic factor um, is not so different between groups that the results we see are impacted by them. So waterfall trial, um, um, middle-aged patients, you know, in their 50s, predominantly had gallstone cause of pancreatitis. Um, over 50% of them had hypovolemia at trial entry. Now, the mean bicep and mean Charleston comorbidity index is important. The mean bicep score of one means that these patients were a bit on the lower risk side. 
and the mean Charleston comorbidity index of two suggested they didn't have a ton of comorbidities, which I think is very important um, because when we look at the results, I think we can look at it from a bit of a different point of view. So again, thinking about why we give fluids, we give fluids in pancreatitis hoping that it will reduce the likelihood of developing moderately severe or severe acute pancreatitis during the hospital stay. And in this trial, getting aggressive fluid resuscitation, numerically speaking, actually led to more moderately severe or severe acute pancreatitis. Now, if you look at the 95% confidence interval and p-value, um, I would say this result was not necessarily statistically significant, um, but certainly raises concern that maybe giving more aggressive fluids does not necessarily equal better outcomes in these patients. We did see a significant increase in the likelihood of fluid overload in patients who got aggressive fluid resuscitation as compared to moderate. And if you think about our patients or the characteristics of the patients, so they were um, a BICEP of one, a Charleston comorbidity index two. So these were uh, patients that didn't have a lot of comorbidities. The fact that um, receiving all this fluid led to fluid overload in them you could only imagine then if somebody did have underlying kidney disease, heart disease, liver disease, um, that these numbers could be even higher. So aggressive fluids did not lead to less severe pancreatitis in this patient population. Unfortunately, it did lead to more fluid overload. And if you worked it out and calculated the number needed to harm, it would actually equal seven. Now, there are some considerations here. The trial was stopped early due to that harm signal of more fluid overload and numerically more cases of moderately severe to severe acute pancreatitis and those receiving aggressive fluids. So I can really only comment on harm. I can't really comment on efficacy. Again, this was a trial population with mild disease. And then there was some concern about whether the fluid therapy given here may differ from clinical practice, like the amount of fluid the aggressive arm got was almost close to eight liters as compared to five and a half. Um, and depending upon where you practice, you know, sometimes two to four liters might be kind of more typical for what people would receive. So in asking this question, what's the best fluid resuscitation strategy for this patient? Honestly, I don't think we know. Uh, I think we can probably say that the higher fluid resuscitation strategies um, probably result in harm. And unfortunately, we will need better, more controlled studies to be able to figure out what is the ideal fluid resuscitation strategy in these patients. Let's go to this third case. So a 62-year-old male that has hypertension and stage 4 CKD presents to clinic for follow-up. He has no new concerns. He takes amlodipine 5 milligrams daily, lisinopril 40 milligrams daily, and aspirin 81 milligrams daily. Blood pressure is 132 over 85 and heart rate is 50. Physical exam is unremarkable. He has labs obtained at this visit, knowable for serum creatinine of 3 with a baseline 2.4 and a UACR 600 milligrams per gram. And he asked, you know, doc, is there any drug that can save his kidneys? So just to, to ponder for a second before I go to the next slide, what would be the next best step in management for this patient? And I've kind of outlined some different management possibilities here. Um, so I'll give just a moment on this slide, and then we'll talk about this next trial. So this uh, trial looked at adult patients with stage 3B or 4 CKD. Um, the intervention was empagliflozin, also goes by a trait named Chardiance, 10 milligrams daily, and a matching placebo pill. And the outcomes they cared about were worsening kidney dysfunction and death from cardiovascular causes. 
So CKD has been uh, on the rise, unfortunately, in the past 10 years. Um, but thankfully, our understanding of the disease and what we can do has changed too. So when looking at data for diabetes and CKD in the US population, we know that diabetes is strongly associated with the development of albuminuria and reduced EGFR, really independent of demographics hypertension and contributes to the burden of CKD in the US. As a matter of fact, diabetes is the culprit for CKD in almost 40% of patients um, currently in the US. But even if a patient doesn't have diabetes, if they have albuminuria from other reasons, we also know that changes in the amount of albumin in the urine is associated with not only the development of CKD, but also the rate of decline. And as a result of thinking about that, you know, it tells us that there are opportunities, hopefully, when looking at how can we reduce albumin in the urine to being able, hopefully, to reduce EGFR decline and help our patients. So SGLT2s have kind of proliferated in this area as one of our go-to drugs after um, ACE inhibitors such as losinopril or ARB such as losartan. So where did the story begin? You go all the way back to the IMPAREG outcome study, which is one of the first cardiovascular outcome trials of the SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, that trial showed a great benefit for SGLT2 inhibitors on cardiovascular outcomes in that patient population. However, they did some secondary analyses and they found for instant or worsening nephropathy and a post hoc renal composite outcomes that patients receiving empagliflozin had less instant or worsening nephropathy and less of that post hoc renal composite outcome. Now, these were secondary outcomes. So that means that the studies that this particular study was not powered um, to actually adjudicate this particular outcome in a meaningful way. But it certainly provided um, some context to be able to say like, are SGLT2 inhibitors not only drugs for diabetes, but are they also heart drugs? And now are they drugs for the kidneys? So there was a proliferation of trials. So one of them was the so-called Credence trial. So this was looking at canagliflozin, and also goes by a trait named Invocana in renal outcomes in type 2 diabetes and nephropathy. And notice that um, in patients with diabetes and pretty significant albuminuria, that there was a, a significant reduction in both renal specific and cardiovascular outcomes. There was actually more reduction in renal specific outcomes with the use of the SGLT2 inhibitor canagliflozin. Now, when canagliflozin first came out of the market, there was concerns about fracture and amputation risk. Um, in this trial and subsequent ones to it, we have not seen statistically significant increases in fracture, in fracture and amputation risk. And that's not something, thankfully, that impacts my decision making when using this drug now in practice. But with Credence, you know, we we're looking at patients with EGFRs between 30 to 90, all of them had diabetes. But we know that you can have CKD with albuminuria without diabetes. So could um, these classes of drugs still benefit there? And that's where this trial came in. This is the DAPA CKD trial. So this looked at um, 4,000 patients, slightly lower EGFR of 25 to 75, while two thirds of them had diabetes, a third of them did not. And again, the amount of albuminuria was a little bit lower. And we noticed the same thing, that there was a, a large reduction in this composite kidney outcome of decline in GFR, ESKD, and death from renal cardiovascular causes. Um, so as we look at this, it's like, okay, well, maybe these are kidney drugs and we can use them to a pretty low EGFR. And um, we had been waiting up until the latter part of last year and now it's this year for this trial to come out where they were going to look at patients also with or without diabetes, higher number, and down to a lower EGFR of 20. And that is what we get with MPA kidney. It was an international triple blind parallel group placebo control trial, over 6,000 patients that had an EGFR that went all the way down to 20 
Um, and then actually minimal albuminuria at 200. Um, these patients did a run-in period of six weeks on a stable dose of whatever renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system blockade agent, whether that was an ACE inhibitor like lisinopril or an ARB like losartan. And they looked at kidney disease progression or death from cardiovascular causes. Now, these patients were mostly in their 60s. Over half of them did not have diabetes and a large portion of them actually did not have cardiovascular disease. They did have low EGFRs. And I would say they had moderate um, albuminuria. And similar to the tail we saw with Credence, with DAPA CKD, um, there was a reduction in renal specific and cardiovascular outcomes with the use of empagliflozin. Um, and this was mostly borne out at about a year of follow-up and persisted up to two and a half years of follow-up in the study. Now, they did look at safety outcomes, particularly lower limb amputation, as well as ketoacidosis. Ketoacidosis was rare. Um, like six, seven patients total had it. Um, so again, while a, a concern, certainly not one that I think um, factors very much into my decision making, um, unless again, a patient uh, had diabetes already and had uh, prior diabetic ketoacidosis, I probably wouldn't use it. And then lower limb amputations were numerically more um, with um, empagliflozin as compared to placebo. This result was not statistically significant, and I would argue for how large the trial was, the overall number of them is also pretty small. So empagliflozin did reduce the incidence of kidney disease progression in a broad range of CKD patients. So with or without diabetes, with minimal uh, proteinuria, with a lot of proteinuria, with uh, CKD from multiple different causes. Um, Empagliflozin caused numerically more episodes of DKA and lower limb amputation. But again, I would argue the risk was overall low. And in both cases, those results were not statistically significant. So, um, there are some considerations, though. Um, the long run-in period may have selected out for healthier patients or patients that, by social circumstance or other things, may be able to be more adherent. So you do have to factor that into play. We don't actually know if patients had even lower levels of the area. So what if it was like 100 or 50 milligrams per gram? Would they have the same benefits? And they did notice in this trial that there were fewer cardiovascular events. One hypothesis for that could be that, you know, as compared to when Imparec outcome and other cardiovascular outcome trials of SGLT2 inhibitors came out, we now have so many drugs that impact cardiovascular outcomes that we might end up seeing fewer uh, cardiovascular events than we normally do. So I would say in this trial, adding empagliflozin would, or sorry, in this particular patient, adding empagliflozin would be reasonable for their hope of a drug that might save their kidney. Case four, we have a 67-year-old woman undergoes uncomplicated left total hip arthroplasty by orthopedic surgery, had a prior history of provoked left leg DVT after a trauma many years ago, Medicine orthopedic surgery discussed plans for VT prophylaxis post surgery, and orthopedic surgery recommends aspirin daily for VTE prophylaxis. And so, the question here is thinking about what is the best DVT prophylaxis in this patient? And I've listed a number of different options that one may or may not consider. <laughs> so, if we break this down by PICO, what we're, what this trial looked at was adult patients that either underwent total hip arthroplasty or total knee arthroplasty and received aspirin compared to anoxaparin for DVT prophylaxis, and they looked at the outcome of developing a DVT that was symptomatic. So why is this important? Um, 1.5 million total hip arthroplasties and total knee arthroplasties occur in the U.S. annually. And 2% of patients getting those can have symptomatic venous thromboembolism. 
if you look between 2010 and 2021, there has been a steady rise in the use of aspirin for VT prophylaxis due to some data in the surgical literature. There have been EJM trials published on it. And so it is fair that um, I, even in clinic, I've seen patients that recently saw surgery that are on this. So the CRYSTAL trial, it was a cluster randomized crossover non-inferiority trial over 9,000 patients. And what they looked at was all adult patients undergoing total hip arthroplasty, total knee arthroplasty, with no contraindication to the study drug. And they looked at symptomatic VTEs up to 90 days after surgery. So I want to quickly pause here and just mention non-inferiority. So these trials are used to demonstrate that a new treatment is not substantially less effective than something that's standard. And we use them when the new therapy is thought to be safer, easier to administer, less costly. And ideally they're done when a standard RCT with placebo would be unethical to undertake. So in this case, it would be unethical to randomize somebody to receiving something for VTE prophylaxis or receiving nothing. And so where in general, the gold standard has been to use a low molecular weight heparin like anoxaparin and we're using aspirin to say like by a certain margin is it not is it not substantially less effective and that is what i have depicted here so non-inferiority says we're willing to accept some margin of this being uh, not as effective as whatever the reference treatment is because again it's easier to give uh has other benefits etc and Therefore, in non-inferiority trials, you can either determine that something is non-inferior, you can determine that it's non-inferior and superior, you can determine that it's inferior, or it can frankly be inconclusive. So in this trial, we mostly had patients in their late 60s, BMI of 30, mostly ASA class 2 to 3, um, with a low incidence of prior VTE. And most of them underwent total knee arthroplasty. When we look at the results, we see um, a difference, um, not favorably, in terms of uh, symptomatic VTEs between anoxaparin and aspirin. And so um, there was a 1.7 percentage point difference between um, anoxaparin and aspirin in terms of rates of VTE. Um, not, and that was mostly driven by DVTs, did not see the same per se with PEs. So aspirin did not meet the non-inferiority margin to have this trial that I believe was 1%. And so in this case, they actually found aspirin was inferior to anoxaparin for reducing symptomatic DVTs. And in this trial, aspirin is also associated with numerically higher rates of PEs. Now there's some important stuff here. This trial does not necessarily prove superiority of anoxaparin. It just simply says that aspirin as given in the trial um, was inferior. Now the outcome was driven mostly by below the knee deep venous thrombosis. One particular challenge with this trial is that aspirin dose used in this trial may not be typical for a lot of my patients that I've seen in clinic um, that receive aspirin for VT prophylaxis. They often, uh, they often have it uh, BID dosing. So the once a day dosing maybe was a, enough of a difference to impact that. And the cost effectiveness considerations of this are still unclear. But I would say we do have evidence based off this probably to say that in this mixed cohort, an parin would probably be preferred. I won't say it's, it's superior, but probably be preferred. And one last case, and we'll wrap up for this evening. So a 72-year-old man with heart failure, reduced EF, presents to the hospital with acute decompensated heart failure improves with IV diuretics and GDMT titration while inpatient. He is ready for discharge and the team is discussing what is the optimal loop diuretic for the patient to go home using. And so this is all about mortality. So does a particular loop diuretic torosamide reduce all-cause mortality compared to ferrosamide for patients with 
heart failure reduced ejection fraction. So to make a PICO of this trial, this looked at hospitalized patients with acute decompensated heart failure, um, randomized to receive either torzomide or ferrozomide, and to look at all-cause mortality and what's called a time-to-event anal analysis. So why is this important? There are over 900,000 hospitalizations for acute decompensated heart failure yearly, and the one-year mortality rate uh, can be 17.4% after a hospitalization, and the rehospitalization rate can be up to 44%. So transform heart failure was a multi-center block randomized, which you know now, non-stratified unblinded RCT, looking at 2,859 patients. Only inclusion criteria was a recent heart, heart failure hospitalization with the EF less than 40%, and plans for long-term diuretic use. And they use a dosing guide of about one milligram of torazomide equaling anywhere from two to four milligrams of ferrosomide. Now, I do wanna talk a little bit about that whole time to event thing. So I want you to imagine two studies which end up at the same place, but take very different paths to get there and they're depicted here. And if you think about most RCTs, that is actually what you're seeing. There are two studies. There are a study of what happens with patients using one drug versus what happens with patients using another drug. And that journey they take to get to whatever the outcome is, mortality, um, heart attacks, et cetera, is what we depict with these things called time to event analyses or Kaplan-Meier curves. Now, most Kaplan-Meier curves are built off the idea of a hazard ratio, which is what's called the risk ratio at any point in time, meaning that I could look at any point in time and say that a patient has a 15% increase or decrease risk for the outcome of interest of that trial. So that becomes important when we think about transform heart failure. This is a trial of mostly uh, uh, patients in their mid-60s, um, mostly male. Um, more of them had chronic heart failure as compared to newly diagnosed heart failure. A third of them have been hospitalized for heart failure in the past year. And the overwhelming majority had an EF less than 40%, with many of them using ferrosamide prior to the uh, trial. When they looked at all-cause mortality, they did not note a statistically significant difference between the use of torzomide as compared to ferrosomide. The reason they thought torzomide might have a benefit is because of its more favorable pharmacokinetics. It undergoes less first-pass metabolism in the gut. And so there was thoughts that maybe for that reason, torzomide might be better. Um, they looked at everything from um, all-cause mortality or all-cause hospitalization did not see a statistically significant benefit. Same for total hospitalizations. Um, and even when they just looked uh, over 30 days, did not notice necessarily any significant benefits either. So I think the bottom line from this trial is torzomide did not significantly reduce all-cause mortality more than ferrosomide, and therefore considerations of mortality shouldn't necessarily be a driving factor behind the use of torzomide or not in patients. So some considerations of transform heart failure. Is all-cause mortality the right outcome? We don't know. Um, for years, we have had diuretics as part of the treatment strategy for heart failure, mostly for relief of symptoms, not necessarily for impacts on mortality. Um, and so, we previously have not shown that diuretics impact mortality, so it's kind of not surprising that it was not shown to impact mortality in this trial. There was some imprecision in the conversion of torzomide to ferrosomide, and so that might apply. And then um, there's a large portion of patients now that actually have heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, and would these data look the same and or different in those patients? So I would say, again, it does not reduce. So in conclusion, I hope I've shown that EBM is not robotic. It is grounded in three rules, that not all evidence is created equal, 
that evidence alone is never enough and that clinicians make recommendations. In terms of the trials, we discussed sips of pickle juice do improve cramp severity in patients with cirrhosis. The optimal fluid resuscitation volume in acute pancreatitis presently is unknown. Empagliflozin um, does reduce worsening kidney disease in patients with advanced CKD, whether or not they have diabetes. Once daily aspirin is inferior to anoxaparin for symptomatic VTE uh, risk reduction after a total hip arthroplasty or total knee arthroplasty, and torzomide does not reduce all-cause mortality in patients recently discharged with acute decompensated heart failure. These are the references that I use uh, for this presentation. And with that, I will stop my share and be happy to take any questions.